This is a Ferrari? This is a Ferrari 308 Quattro Valvole, which means four valve. Jerry Seinfeld is obsessed with automobiles. In the mid 80s, if you wanted to show off a little, yeah. this is what you would get. It was his wife who suggested he host an American version of the BBC hit, Top Gear. I started thinking, well, if I wanted to do a show with cars that was funny, I think, well, gee, I know every funny person in the world. That's how he hatched the idea for his internet series. Hi, I'm Jerry Seinfeld, and this is Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. The hard part was finding anyone that wanted to do it, believe it or not. You actually met resistance on this? Every single place I went. What did they say to you? What is, well, I don't understand what you're trying to do. Chocolate egg cream? And a cup of coffee, please. And you can drink coffee all day? All day. It would give me ang horrible anxiety. I like the anxiety. He was trying to create a show where comedians... You shouldn't be so irritated because you meditate. Even when you're meditating, you're like, really? Could talk <laughs> about their favorite subject, comedy. That's not comedy. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> this is a show about comedy. Yeah, really. <laughs> oh, this is the greatest show ever. <laughs> I would commit to 22 episodes of <laughs> this. Yeah. He pitched every internet outlet he could think of with the idea, and none of them wanted it. Wow. And I thought, what kind of track record do you have to have? <laughs> I mean, you, you get, get to a certain point in the business, what a man is looking for in a network is the same thing he's looking for in his underwear. He's looking for a little bit of support and a little bit of freedom. Sony's website, Crackle, finally picked it up. <laughs> and Seinfeld's having the last laugh. Lie. Comedians in Cars, now launching its sixth season, has been viewed nearly 100 million times. Wait, we should be backing up while that sound is happening. I thought maybe you were still waiting for something good to happen. Oh, no. <laughs> you gave, Seinfeld you gave says when two comedians get together, there's some kind of chemical connection. <laughs> right. Part of it to me is this kind of social experiment of yeah. like, I sometimes think of it as I'm just trying to isolate a gene yeah. here and, <laughs> and put it on display. I go, look at these weird people. <laughs> Am I driving too fast for you? No, no, no. Are you I'm comfortable? Fine. Okay. I love comedy as much as I love it. I love talking about it. You like breaking it down and you like the anatomy of it. Yes, and I also like that as much as I know, it, the whole thing is still just this smoke ring of nothing mm -hmm. that nobody can really seem to nail down. At heart, Seinfeld considers himself a stand-up comic. Jerry Seinfeld. This is such an unbelievable experience. He often likes to make surprise appearances at his favorite clubs. For you, this is great. For me, it's horrible. It shows I really haven't gotten anywhere. Do you need it? Yeah, it's just like if you're a surfer, you paddle out. How do you feel when you're walking on stage in that circumstance? Here goes nothing. <laughs> I've been doing this my whole life. This is how he tests and refines his material. People usually around this age make a bucket list. Uh, I made a bucket list, and I turned a B to an F, and I was done with it. That's... You break comedy down in an architectural way. Almost. Yes, I do. Not every comedian does. Why do you think you do? So I'm an analytical guy. I like science. I like math. I like structure, I like logic. Yeah. I do this joke about, you know, in marriage, the most important thing is you gotta listen. A lot of wives complain their husbands don't listen. I've never heard my wife say this, she may have. <laughs> so, I've never had another joke quite like that joke. In its structure? It just has its own structure to it. It's like a magic trick. He's 61 now and has been working comedy clubs since 1975. Could you throw everything else away that you've done and you do and just have stand-up? Oh, yeah. I kind of dream of that. Because? It's so pure, and I, and I just love it. A laugh is such a pure thing. There's no opinion to it. Right. Almost every other creative field has to suffer the interpretive opinion culture, right. but not a stand-up comic. 
You may not like this guy, but if he's getting laughs, he's going to work. Seinfeld doesn't need the money. Forbes estimates his net worth at upwards of $800 million, most of it from his TV series, which two decades later, his fans will still quote back to him. Hello! They will mostly just yell at me things from the show, uh -huh. which I always explain to them, it's not funny to me. I wrote that for you. <laughs> There's nothing less funny to a comedian than his own material. Is that true, really? Yeah, I'm sick of it. I suffered to come up with that. I'm done with it. But are you still master of your domain? I am king of the county. <laughs> you? Lord of the manor. But when the series was done in 1998, its creator admits he was lost. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was pretty confused at that moment. I bet. What the hell do you do now, you know? Because you can't really top it. No. Impossible. There's only one way to top it. Yeah. And that's to remain uh, an artist and not a star. So he went back into the belly of the beast, even if some nights are rough. I don't go, oh, who cares? I got a hit TV series and I've done all that. I don't think that. I think this is horrible. Yeah. And I like that. What do you like about getting I, it? It means I'm not an ass. I'm, I'm, I haven't become a giant show business ass, pardon my language. It was very much what I didn't want to be when I finished my TV series. I don't want to be that guy. And I know if I stick to stand up, I can't be that guy. Because they'll remind it's, you. Yeah, they'll remind me in two seconds. Have you ever thought you were in danger of going down that path? I was then, yes. You were? Sure. I didn't need to come down from that flying saucer. Most people don't want to. No, they don't. Why do you think you did? I wasn't a 20-something right. that suddenly hit it big. I, I knew a little bit of life. I don't want to be spared the, the grime. The griminess is what I like. I felt like it's what made me good. Is this something you'd want your kids to do? My daughter could do it. She could? She could. I don't think she will, but she's got the, she got it somehow. Which is the first I saw that, wow, this is genetic. Seinfeld and his wife, Jessica, have three children. Sasha, the oldest, is now 14. Have you tried to give her any advice? Yeah, it's like being Thor. They give you the hammer. It's hard to just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> you want her to pick up the hammer? Yeah, pick up the hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld is still wielding his hammer, and he has no plans to put it down. Are you still driven to do this? Yes. That doesn't go away. That has not gone away. To me, every joke is like a cool thing. Yeah. That didn't exist in the world before you made it. For me, at this point in my life, I just, I want to find as many bits as I can before I'm dead. So already you're thinking, hey, this is pretty fun, right? Not so bad. Yeah. She may not look it. Of course, legions of plastic surgeons have camouflaged her over the years. But Joan Rivers will be 77 this week. She's still prowling the red carpet. Comedy pass, comedy pass. You don't get the recognition you deserve. Damn right, William. And now, enjoying something of a revival. I have a fan. I have William. There's a new documentary about her. These are all my jokes. These are jokes over the last 30 years. And she just got her own TV show. Not bad for a woman who started in the 60s as one of the few female comics out there. Me, if God wanted me a cookie, would have given me aluminum hands. Was it hard no. to be a female comedian back no, then? No, no. And I'm so tired of hearing that. I'm so tired. People say, well, oh, I'm a woman, and so they don't laugh. Let me tell you, if Hitler had six good jokes, they'd be saying, you know, he's changed. He went to uh, Nazi rehab, Betty Ford Berg, and, <laughs> and he's fine now. No, if 
if you're funny, you could be anything. So is she funny? I, 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 I Jesus freak convention. They are the ugliest people on. I have an agent. Well, this will be good. Joan and Jesus freaks. Uh -huh. hey, Enough uh, people think she is to fill up the rooms when she performs. Joan Rivers jewelry, twenty nine. <laughs> well, you think you're gonna get this on QVC for twenty nine bucks made by Union? Are you f***ing crazy? <laughs> Okay, little Imelda, what would you rather be, an eight-year-old prostitute in Brazil or come work for Aunt Joni in her nice air-conditioned basement? <laughs> and it's Christmas. Look, you can touch the dog. That's it. Back to work. With a mouth like a sailor and a voice like a foghorn, it's hard to imagine that Joan Rivers might well have become, well, what's one of the farthest things from a foul-mouthed comedian? I would not have minded being an anthropologist if I could have brought hair and makeup with me. Didn't your mother always tell you it's good to have something to fall back Didn't on? have something to fall back on. Go dig. Right. <laughs> but seriously, folks, she went to Barnard and took a class taught by Margaret Mead. When I started doing comedy in clubs, I went to her and she gave me, which, when you think of the clubs I work at, she gave me um, little questionnaires to ask the women. And I would leave on the tables little questionnaires with little pencils, and the women could fill out uh, who makes the money in your house, who It was all women's lib was just coming in, and I would send them back to Mrs. Mead. Sometimes I have trouble telling when you're putting me on. Are no. You me on? No. You did research for Margaret Mead in, yes. your, in your comedy club? Yes. Well, what did you discover? We discovered that women were very still dominated by men, but just starting to break through. It would be a few years before Joan Rivers would break through and make it big. She was still Joan Malinsky, the daughter of Russian emigres, a very bright young lady from Larchmont, well, and Brooklyn, where she spent the first 12 years of her life. What were you like as a child? I mean, were you serious as a child? No, my father was a doctor and very funny. And uh, we're all very funny. My, I think he was DNA. In the Malinsky household, being funny as a family was okay. Being funny as a job? That made the parents very nervous. They really thought I was going down the wrong path. I would work the clubs in Greenwich Village and come home three, four, five o'clock in the morning. You know, they just, they didn't know what to make of it. Oh, I, did. I went out with anything, anything. And I, I would get obscene phone calls. I'd say, hang on, let me get a cigarette. The funny thing is, Joan Rivers didn't start out to be a comedian. She wanted to be a dramatic actress until she learned how hard that could be. I also learned uh, that you go through any door that opens. So I would do comedy at night and make $6 in the club so I could make the rounds as an actress during the day. And then the comedy took off. Then the writing took off. Eventually, she got noticed by Johnny Carson, who put her on his show, and that, Joan Rivers says changed everything. After seven years of little clubs, he said, you're going to be a star. Right smack. And my life changed. How did it change? I was going to the bank the next day to kite a check, because in those days you'd go in, you'd say, could you hold another day? And they, you know, it was all done person to person. And they said, ah, saw you last night. No problem. I knew my life's different. Rivers says Carson made her and then tried to break her. She became his permanent guest host on The Tonight Show until she took a job hosting a competing talk show on the Fox Network. And I am just so, so happy to be here, and I thank you all so much. Carson never spoke to her again. The Late Show starring Joan Rivers was a disaster and the beginning of the darkest chapter in her life. The show lasted just eight months. And thank you all so much for watching me. I'll be back a lot sooner than you Yay. all may think. Her husband, Edgar Rosenberg, was the executive producer. After the show was canceled, he committed suicide, leaving her with a daughter and debts and in the depths of despair. Everything was taken away. Dramatic, dramatic. But I truly started from ground zero again. No, negative numbers because I had the reputation of she's hard to work with. My Fox show had failed. My husband committed suicide, so she must be a terrible person. Just everything went to hell in a handbag. Gone. 
She says Carson kept her off late night TV, but in less than three years, she had her own daytime show and rebuilt her career. Yeah, I know. I went through menopause waiting for a bus in Beverly Hills. I mean, just like... <laughs> Often making jokes out of her troubles. I would go out and I'd say to them, my husband killed himself. You might as well say it. They all know it. And it's my fault because you're making love when I took the paper bag off my head. That was my first joke. And she says it got a laugh. Anything off limits? No. Nothing? Nothing. If it's terrible, if you laugh about it, it's okay. But she's never gotten over her desire to be a serious actress. She's been on Broadway, most notably in Sally Marr and Her Escorts, a play about comedian Lenny Bruce's mother. It was a one-woman show. Joan Rivers wrote it, performed it, and got a Tony nomination. She won some respect, but she did not win the Tony. Diana Rigg, Miss England, she got it instead. Yeah. I wasn't gracious to the party. Congratulations. <laughs> and I also hire old people, so ha ha. You probably throw grandma away, not this chicken. Uh uh. If grandma's sitting there shaking, I put a piece of silver in this hand and a rag in this hand. She can go for hours like that. But actually, if there's one thing Joan Rivers doesn't usually joke about, it's her stage career. She's learned over the years to have a pretty thick skin about critics of her comedy act. Comedy, you could say you didn't like me. I just saw 2,000 people laugh at a joke, so you're wrong. And this is not a but her acting and writing, that's yeah. different. The documentary about her follows her through the production of her latest play, an autobiography, which she had hoped to bring to Broadway. But when critics panned it in London, she wept and decided not to risk the wrath of critics in New York. Don't need to be hurt. Does that surprise you now, looking back on no. every... I mean, you've been hurt in a lot worse ways. Not the way the, the play. Players uh, can't do it to me with my acting. And that's why I'm very careful about what I do. Everywhere you look, if you really look around the house, there are bookshelves. Uh -huh. It is a bit of a surprise that Joan Rivers still sees herself as a dramatic actress. But if her theatrical career didn't go as well as she wanted, don't worry too much about her. Even with all the real-life drama she's been through, she's just fine. Outspoken. I hate kids. Outrageous. Look at this group. And most importantly to her, out there. These, lessons, these are life lessons. And men like them with big breasts and no brains. That's a, you went to college, no man ever put his hand up your dress looking for a library card. I am I'm working. I'm 76 years old, and I'm filling a 2,000-seat room. This is great. And we're all laughing together, and then they're going to give me a check. And then I'm going to go home in a limousine. Yeah, this is really tough. People have said that you're getting crabbier, angrier, yeah. that you're, sure. you know, more strident than you used right. to be. Are you? Rather than me getting angrier or crankier or crabbier, what it is is I'm uh, describing more accurately the world they live in, mm. and from a disappointed standpoint, a disappointment that leads to dissatisfaction, which leads to a kind of finger pointing at them. Look what you've done to yourself. The doctors have an expression for patients who are terminal called circling the drain. And that's what I think this, this species is doing. And I see the, the circles getting faster and smaller. Cartoons may look like child's play, especially when the person on the receiving end of the joke is a grown up. On the house, I never lift a finger. But one cartoon has managed to capture an audience of adults as well as children. I'd rather drink a beer than with father of the year. It's The Simpsons, an unlikely primetime hit that after 12 years running continues to outlast its detractors. Worst episode ever. And still manages to surprise its fans. The sad truth is all families are like us. I think so, huh? Despite their colorful appearances, The Simpsons are a classic sitcom bunch. Father, Homer Simpson, mother, Marge, plus 2.3 children, Bart, 
Lisa and Maggie. This is what is known as aversion therapy. They've got all the problems of any other family, only as cartoons, the Simpsons can do things to each other that real families can only dream of. No, wait a minute. Wait, wait. Folks, folks, if I could... Uh, this is not the way to get healthy! If you want to know who to thank or blame for all this, you need to go here, to Building 42 on the Fox Studio lot in Los Angeles. <laughs> it's where the Simpsons writing staff Break his heart. is starting another day's work. If you didn't know better, you might think this was just a gathering of the show's biggest fans. And in a way, it is. I can't see any pets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still trying to do the same things that the show set out to do 12 years ago. Which are? Which is to uh, make America laugh. All right, brain. You don't like me and I don't like you. But well, let's just do this, and I can get back to killing you with beer. It's a deal. I've always felt we're writing for ourselves. Uh, for the last we, uh, four years, Mike audience. Scully has been responsible for keeping one of television's most but, popular uh, franchises from running out of steam. Yeah, we don't want to be the guys that you know sank the ship. You know? So, just you know, that pride and determination to keep it, you know, as good as the previous year, is kind of, is what keeps you going. Pride, determination, and fear. Yeah, yeah, you bet. <laughs> you bet. And now uh, when Grandpa wags his finger, he doesn't look like he's wagging it. It just suddenly snaps. Well, yeah. It looks like his legs are going. In a business not especially famous for loyalty, the Simpsons writing staff is legendary for its longevity. George Meyer has been here from the start. I mean, at the beginning, you're just scrambling to keep the show on the air. And then after so many years, you start thinking, hey, this really is something important and, and something we might lives, so we better make it good. Come on, everybody. Time for the family portrait. The world first met the Simpsons in 1987. Everybody smile. I'm going to set the automatic timer. And cartoonist Matt Groening began contributing animated segments to the Tracy Ullman show. Good night, son. Two years later, The Simpsons had a show and a life all their own. From the outset, one message was clear. Question authority. Homer Simpson may be a grown-up, but he's still as helpless as any kid in the face of power. Just consider his job, safety supervisor at the world's shoddiest nuclear power plant. Just resting my eyes. Ah, well done. A rested employee is a vigilant employee. It's a guerrilla battle. I mean, the, the authorities have the, the high ground. They have all the money. They have the tradition. They have the history in their favor. So we have to just kind of take pot shots and then run back up into the hills. Pot shots at religion. Looks like slim pickings today, Reverend. Oh, Lord. Uh, try the emergency plate, Ned. Hi, everybody. Medicine. Now, if something should go wrong, Let's not get the law involved. The media. This reporter promises to be more trusting and less vigilant in the future. Excellent. Well, Every uh, institution takes a knock on The Simpsons. Oh, Marge, cartoons don't have any deep meaning. They're just stupid drawings that give you a cheap laugh. Oh, I don't know with my massive blood loss and all. Although I do like the occasional beer. Although I do like the occasional beer. Dan Castellaneta gives life to the words of Homer Simpson. Did you ever see that blue man group? Total ripoff of the Smurfs. And has come up with one of the show's most memorable expressions. Well, dough is an ad lib. Dough, dough, dough. It's always been written in a script as annoyed grunt. Dough, dough, dough. And I asked Matt Graney what, what it was, and he said, uh, whatever you want it to be. Dough, dough, dough. So I remembered this. Comedian from the Laurel and Hardy movies, Jim Finley, you know, always went, do, do. And in an animation, since it has to be faster, it turned into, do, 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 do. I think we can be proud that we never did a bad show. Castellaneta voices more than 60 other characters on the show. There's an exit? For shame. Providing the writers with a virtual repertory company to choose from. Whenever I'm recording the actors, I always hesitate before I say cut at the end of a scene because I never know for sure if they're going to come up with something and I don't want to step on it. And they make the writers look a lot funnier. I thought we could uh, cycle the cat and the dog in the bag. Writers like Al Jean, 
who's getting feedback on his latest script. After the uh, Bill Cosby thing, maybe put an exterior night shot. Just because to me, it's like it's making sausage, sausage, delicious sausage, but you, you really you know, can't be too protective of any particular yeah. thing. If you're going to be a writer, you have to develop a really thick skin uh, because everyone is going to have an opinion about your material. Believe me, if you read something and it bombs, you definitely want it fixed. So every season 13 people come upstairs. Fixed and fast. Not only does The Simpsons team churn out more shows per season than the standard sitcom. The one, the one downside of animation is the schedule. It's year round. Uh, it just never stops. Animation is much more labor intensive. Nine months from conception to delivery for the average episode. I think that the key to that is just trying to keep the standards up and trying to keep a step ahead of the audience. Instead of giving them what they want, giving them what they need. <laughs> and they don't know they want it yet. The Simpsons will wrap up this, their 12th season tonight, with a retelling of some American folk tales. Yeah. All right, uh, let's get started on lunch. It's also a finale for Mike Scully, who's moving on from his post at the helm of the show. But The Simpsons? Well, they're not going anywhere. I'm getting used to never getting noticed. I'm stuck here till I can steal a car. The house is still a mess, and I'm going ball from stress. But we're happy just the way we are. Don't think it's sour grapes, but you're all a bunch of beets. And so I must be. I think we'll ever see her again? I'm sure we will, honey. I'm sure we will. There's something very unsexy about parenting. I mean, let's be serious. You know what I mean? It's like, first of all, your parents did it. Imagine five little kids in a two-bedroom apartment. It almost sounds like the first line to a joke. But to their father, comedian Jim Gaffigan, it's his real life. There's no equation where parenting makes sense. Right. It's like, all right, there's no sleep, the pay's horrible, yet people like it. Can you give the baby some pasta? Yeah. Dinner hour in the Gaffigan apartment is an adventure with nine-year-old Mari, seven-year-old Jack, Katie, who's four, Michael, who's two, and Patrick, the newest addition. If the Gaffigan kids seem somewhat familiar. Remember when you were a kid and you'd go on vacation, you'd be like, why is dad always in a bad mood? <laughs> now I understand. Maybe you've heard about them in their father's stand-up comedy act. I stood in line for an hour and 15 minutes for the Dumbo ride. <laughs> After a minute, I was like, I'm the Dumbo. I'm waiting to see myself. Gaffigan's observational humor about everyday life has made him one of the most popular touring comics in the country. My wife had the baby at home. We had all our babies at home just to make you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> People don't want to hear about home birth. They're like, oh, you had your baby at home. Yeah, we were going to do that, but we wanted our baby to live. Home for the Gaffigans, Jim and his wife Jeannie, who's also his writing partner. This is like Superman. It's Ferrari. Is a two bedroom, fifth floor walk up on Manhattan's Lower East Side. How do you divide the space up here? We got this is the dining room. That's your office over there? That's my office. That's Jeannie's office. Okay. This that's is the, the kids' office. That's the kids' office. This is the gymnasium here. <laughs> You're a successful comedian now. Yeah. Why are you doing this to yourself? Well, it's not, I'm not trying to prove something. <laughs> people, I'll, I'll do book events and people will be like, why are you in that apartment? <laughs> this is not the 1800s, you know? Yeah. Jackson, oh my gosh, how are you, Jackson? <laughs> Gaffigan muses on fatherhood and its challenges in his new book, Dad is Fat. The title comes from the first complete sentence written by his son, Jack. You describe yourself in the book as, as kind of a loner. Yes, I mean, I was very much, I mean, look, most people that are comedians, 
first of all, we're not normal. How are you doing? It's a solitary, introspective pursuit. The characteristics of a comedian are the exact opposite of the characteristics you would want in someone to be a father or a parent. So how did you end up in the middle of five kids? I married a woman who gets pregnant looking at babies. This way. This way. A walk to the park with the Gaffigan clan okay, we got a walk sign, guys. Oh, is like trying to play the Wrangler in a roundup of a herd of runaway scooters. I have no idea what I'm doing. Gaffigan grew up an hour outside of Chicago in Chesterton, Indiana. His own father was a small town banker. Yeah. You mentioned in the book that you did an impression of your dad for your brothers. Oh yeah, in some ways I think I'm a comedian because of my dad. I was the youngest of six kids and my dad was this intimidating figure that all the kids were terrified of. So uh, I, you know, would do an impression of my dad who would be like, <coughs> yeah, Anthony, your name's Anthony, great to see you. And so I would do that as an eight-year-old for my siblings. And so I was suddenly not just competition for food or <laughs> this <laughs> annoying little brother. I was funny, maybe. Gaffigan would graduate from Georgetown University in 1988. When you went to college, you majored in finance. Yes. Well, my father was the first one to go to college in his family. Uh -huh. And I was raised um, to seek security. And security was wearing a coat and tie. So I studied finance, hated it, and then went to work um, as a litigation consultant, was horrible at it. Mm -hmm. And so I was very much lost. How did you find comedy? I was doing an improv class because I had a a fear of public speaking, and uh, someone dared me to do a seminar on stand-up, and then I did it. It's wildly addictive. It's very empowering. The only thing the 46-year-old comic makes fun of, more than his family, is food. I'm moving a little slow tonight. I had a hot pocket for dinner. Uh, uh. His sketch about hot pockets has become his signature routine. I've never eaten a hot pocket and then afterwards been, I'm glad I ate that. I'm always like, I'm gonna die. I paid for that? Did I eat it or rub it on my face? The hot pocket thing, I think I just got lucky. It was this food item. Hot pockets! Single people ate, college students ate, teenagers ate, the audience that mostly consumes stand-up. You know, I struggle with my weight. I'm on this uh, fancy diet, that Domino's pasta bread bowl diet. <laughs> Have you seen the Domino's pasta bread bowl? It's a bread bowl filled with pasta, covered in cheese. The only ingredient missing, a suicide note. <laughs> And I have to admit, the entire time I was eating the Domino's pasta bread, I was thinking, this could use a side of mashed potatoes. <laughs> you rarely hear a swear word in Gaffigan's act. You're considered a clean comedian. Right, right. How do you feel about that? It makes me a little bit like, eh. Do you think it's hurt you in any way? Probably. Family friendly or clean, it just, I think it's associated with something kind of icky. Bob Newhart, Bill Cosby, there were always comedians that happened to be clean, but they, they weren't like, uh, it wasn't like Bill Cosby, he's clean. But it also means this father of five is not afraid to take his own kids to his shows. Nice. They've given Jim Gaffigan plenty of material, and they may give him even more. Are you done having kids? I don't, I, you know, if, I can't believe I'm saying this, but, I mean, well, I'm Catholic. My wife's very Catholic. She's a Shiite Catholic, so there is no goalie. But I'm not opposed to it. I know the, the positives that I can get from uh, each of my children, and I do want to create my own nationality. So <laughs> there will be a country called Afghanistan. <laughs> How my life gets so damn small? Came out here with some big plans, Jimmy. I was gonna do it all just like Sammy Davis Jr. In the new Netflix movie, Dolomite is my name. All my life, people been telling me no. 
Eddie Murphy is the late Rudy Ray Moore. Real hard to break in. I do whatever it takes to get in. A comedian whose life was going nowhere. Let's bring Dolomite to the screen. In desperation, yeah, yeah. Moore created Dolomite. Dolomite is my name! A swaggering, profanity-spewing character who became a sensation in a series of low-budget action films. Do you know karate? No, but I'm a fast learner. I can learn how to chop me a mother Action! Eddie says he doesn't look at reviews, but we did. Let me read you some of the things. Uh, pure joy, Eddie Murphy brings down the house. It's a triumph. Eddie Murphy gives a killer comeback performance. Is it a comeback? I guess, you know, they, they like to say comeback. I don't know. Let's make it easier. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> yes, it's my big comeback. Every 10 years or so, I launch a big comeback. I've been doing that for the last 40 years. Every 10 years, I come back. <laughs> come back or not, the movie has set off an avalanche of accolades and award nominations, including a Golden Globe. And Eddie Murphy and Dolomite is my name. I am Gumby, damn it! You don't talk to me that way! You might say it's another high point in a career with too many high points to count. Why is our old friend Mr. Landlord? Eddie Murphy was only 19 when he joined the cast of Saturday Night Live in 1980. Bringing new life. And actually experience America as a white man. And a new sense of racial awareness. Finally. I was ready. To a show that was then on the verge of cancellation. You know, this is the cleanest and nicest police car I've ever been in in my life. How you doing? He broke new ground in movies, too. Is there a problem, officers? Turning likable characters. Fascinating. America is great indeed. Imagine a country so free, one can throw glass on the streets. There's a new sheriff in town. Into box office heroes. Y'all be cool. You know how kids are, heavy going. I have some ice cream. I have and some then there were his stand-up specials. You didn't get no, cause you are on the welfare. <laughs> Where he'd say everything he couldn't say on network TV. I'm afraid of gay people. Plus, a few things that would make the internet explode if he said them today. When you watch that stuff, do you laugh? Does it, is it still funny to you? Some of it. Some of it I cringe when I watch it. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> I mean, people, people were picketing you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did that bother you? No, in the moment you kind of was like, hey, it's just, it is, what it, it is what it is, you know? Does it bother you now? I, I've seen stuff that I go like, oh, that's... Ooh, yeah, you get a joke every now and then that's cringy. But that's not to say that I don't appreciate it. I, can, I still appreciate it. And I'm, I'm looking at it within the context of the times, you know. I'm going, okay, I'm a kid saying that. No regrets. None whatsoever. Nah. Hi, I'm Eddie Murphy. Um... And he has no regrets about the 1988 Oscars when, years ahead of his peers, he called out the Academy for its lack of diversity. I said, but I just feel that we have to be recognized as a people. I just want you to know, I'm going to give this award, but black people will not ride the caboose of society, and we will not bring up the rear anymore. I want you to recognize us. At the time, did you have people saying, ooh, Eddie, you shouldn't have done that? No, you know what's interesting? After I said that, uh, <laughs> it went the exact opposite way. There was no mention. It was almost like I wasn't at the awards that night. The next day, there was no mention of it in the paper. Not even a blip. Not a blip, and there were no pictures of me at the Oscars. And I'll probably never win an Oscar for saying this, but hey, what the hey, I gotta say it. You said in that speech, you know, and this probably ruins my chance of getting nominated for an Oscar, but... Sure and then I didn't, I didn't get nominated for Oscars for years. You think that had something to do with it? I don't know, <laughs> what do you, what do you <laughs> think? <laughs> you can fake your way to the top. He did eventually get a nomination for the 2006 movie Dreamgirls. And he might be in line for another Oscar nod soon. 
But Eddie Murphy says his staying power is about more than just talent. How was that? I've always been really comfortable in my skin. It's because I've, uh, I've always been grounded spiritually, you know, and I believe in God and I believe in prayer. Do you pray every day? Then? Yeah, I pray all the time, you know. I pray all the time. And you don't have to, like, get down on your knees and pray, you know. You can pray wherever. You know what I found? A lot of people in show business that get really successful at an, at an early age, uh, a lot of them go through a lot of stuff and have issues and drug problems and all these and are self-destructive. And I never had that because I was uh, grounded spiritually. Three. Lord have mercy. I'm killing us. I'm killing Murphy him. says what also grounds him. him is family. He has 10 children ages 1 to 30, and he had no problem taking me to school. Look at the score here. Yeah. 25. 13. Don't think that I was going to take it easy on your ass. <laughs> At 58, Eddie still has a lot of game left in him. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A Earlier this month, he made his triumphant return to mine? SNL. I am still your neighbor. <laughs> and there's a new stand-up special in the works. With Eddie Murphy, like any great comedian, it's all about perfect timing. My neighborhood has gone through so much. It's gone through something called gentrification. <laughs> Can you say gentrification, boys and girls? It's like a magic trick. White people pay a lot of money, and then poof, all the black people are gone. <laughs> What's it like to get that kind of laugh from somebody, like that fall on the floor, gut-busting laugh from somebody? There's nothing like making people laugh. And uh, being, <laughs> being able to do that for a living is a blessing and a privilege. There's no higher calling for an artist. There's nothing like hearing that big crowd of people. Just hearing people laugh, it's nothing like that, you know? Nothing. How are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting over not walking. It's rough. It's got to be hard because you are such a physical comedian. It's frustrating as hell. Yeah. But uh, like my daughter said, Dad, would you have liked not to make 90? I said, no, I'm very happy about it. He's a bit less mobile now. But for Jerry Lewis, not walking doesn't mean not working. In his latest film, Max Rose, he's a retired jazz artist coming to terms with his wife's passing. And I never told you, Ava, but you breathe nicer than anyone I've ever known in my life. Why Max Rose? I fell in love with the material. Vonnegut is on Charlie Rose tonight. That man is a horse's ass. In this role, his facial expressions say it all. Then again, they always have. The typewriter scene from 1963's Who's Minding the Store is a good example. Jerry Lewis made more than five dozen sight gag heavy films by himself and as half of what was once the most popular comedy team on the planet. Here comes the band. <laughs> Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin first teamed up in 1946, post-war New York. I fell in love with him the day we met. You want to come up for coffee? And within weeks, they were selling out shows with their own brand of sex appeal and slapstick. Why are you waiting? <laughs> I forgot what song we were singing. <laughs> <laughs> For you and Dean, it almost seemed like anarchy. Is that the right way to describe it? Yeah, pretty good. That's as good an ex explanation as I've ever heard. I loved him so much, and I knew how much he loved me. Jesus Christ, I'm telling you stuff I haven't talked about in 50 years. Thank you. We were both six feet tall. I took his shoes one day and put lifts on him so that he would be a little taller than me. 
because you thought that was better for the bit if well, you looked oh yeah. younger. You can't do that unless you're feeling it. <laughs> but after a nonstop decade together, they weren't feeling it anymore. The two parted ways in 1956 and wouldn't even speak to each other for nearly 20 years. You said you loved each other. Did you still love each other when you split up? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. It just was time? It, it was time for us both. My head keeps spinning. I go to sleep and keep grinning. Martin, of course, hit new heights on his own. Beginning. My life is going to be You rude, discourteous, ego. And Lewis became a top it, box right? office draw. I understand it. Only this morning, looking in the mirror before shaving, I enjoyed seeing what I saw so much I couldn't tear myself away. Have some, baby? Yeah. Under his direction, slapstick comedy became performance art. Young man, that boss is worth $7,000. For this scene in 1964's The Patsy, he broke hundreds of vases, training himself to catch them just before they hit. Lewis, who learned his craft on the fly by watching people on movie sets, that is a simple way to remember, wound up teaching a film goes. class to grad students at the University the of Southern California. Any questions? Who was in your class? I had Steven Spielberg. About 12 guys from a class of 60 made it in the big, in the bigs, we called it. The really bigs. The bigs, yeah. I'm going to work, dude. All right, places, please. And in 1960, he made another, lesser known contribution to filmmaking, video assist, that is instant video replay of a movie scene after a take. Today, it's something directors can't live without. The video assist was invented by Jerry because nobody had any idea what they were getting until the operator blessed it or until the operator critiqued it. There should be a sign, you know, saying <laughs> Jerry Lewis invented this. I got my education from film people. But today, in Jerry's Las Vegas home, the Oscar that sits atop his TV isn't for technical achievement or a specific film. It's the Academy's Humanitarian Award for his other career. One more. Go, now, Tiffany! Oh! For millions, it just wasn't Labor Day until Jerry hit his number on the Muscular Dystrophy Telethon, which he hosted from 1966 to 2010. You raised an incredible amount of money. I'll give you an exact figure. Two billion, seven hundred million accounted for. I think you're so adorable. The money led to research and longer lifespans for MD patients, but it didn't buy a cure. And at times, Lewis could only watch as the disease claimed another of his kids. The days and hours I spent in hospital hallways waiting for the answer to this child, is he going to live or die? And I took it very personal. Each one. How could he die? Look at the work I've done. And what do we do with all that money? Why don't we use it to help him? How do you answer that? You don't. You don't. Oh, God almighty. I could, I could write a book on children's reactions to meeting their clown. One child says to the coordinator, if I didn't get muscular dystrophy, I'd have never met him. Oh my goodness. And then these children look at you like you're some kind of god. I'm not a god, I just love people, and I love people that are well. I don't like to see someone sick. The MDA telethon had its critics, but also had its moments. And one of the greatest happened 40 years ago today, September 4th, 1976, when Frank Sinatra brought out a mystery guest. Would you send my friend out, please? Where is he? We just send him out here. Come here. Did you have any idea? 
what he was up to. Everybody knew but me. All right, all right, break it up, break it up. Martin and Lewis never did get their old act back together, not even after this. Uh, so you're working? But they stayed close until Dean Martin died on Christmas Day in 1995. You can't write love off or put it on hold. It stays with you until death. And I don't know, it doesn't continue. That's the thing. Do you still think about Dean now? Oh, sure. There isn't a day I don't think about him. And the fact that he left and died, I can't believe how bad I was that he died on me. I knew he would do it. <laughs> so uh, I have to ask you this question. You working? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Christ, all the time. Do you know what a wrench is, sir? A wrench? That's where Jewish cowboys live, a, a wrench. <laughs> the twice married father of seven is still performing live with no plans to quit. Is there a goal you have now? I want to live a little. You want to live a, little, a live a little longer? Yeah. What's a little longer? Well, I'm 90. I figure maybe four or five would be nice. In the twilight of an unforgettable life, all Jerry Lewis really wants is a little bit more. When you were about two or three, your dad used to get you to say cuss words to a uh, company. Well, what would you call it? Uh, Cuss words. Curses. Um, yeah, yeah. He thought it was hilarious to teach me dirty words, you know. And I would say them, you know, as like a three-year-old and get this wild laughter, you know. And it became addictive. And it's like that kind of shock value, you know, became something that I was constantly seeking out. When you're dealing with taboo subjects, it does seem to cross the line. Sorry. You have some... I felt like I had schmutz. I would tell you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, is it hypocrisy that bugs you, or is it just people who have intense points of view that you just want to needle, or...? A lot of times it's um, having a strong opinion and then just going the opposite direction. I've had people, uh, you know, like a, a Jewish person in the audience, like, die laughing at jokes about Mexican people and black people and, you know, this and that, and then you do a joke about Jews or the Holocaust, and it's like, whoa, that's not funny. You know, so it's just... It yeah, depends just... on your perspective and the prism from which you're watching your humor, right? That's beautiful. Thank you. All right. This is the last time you'll see Louis Anderson. I'm leaving him in here. I just want Chip to be happy. That's all I've ever wanted. Yes, that's Anderson, playing Zach Galifianakis' mother on the FX series Baskets. I'm here. This is no joke, he says. He takes the part of Christine Baskets very seriously. We followed him into that makeup trailer and for the next two hours watched Louis Anderson transform. He went from the self-deprecating gap tooth comic most of us know. Here she is to a not-so-bad-looking middle-aged woman that he Thank says he sure recognized that. right away. It's amazing. Look at this. Same thing here. Yeah. Cool. Cheeks and everything exactly the same. Yeah. You're definitely her son. <laughs> I'm definitely her, her brood, right? <laughs> yeah. His mom, Aura Zella Anderson, passed away nearly three decades ago. And yet, for the last three seasons, Louis Anderson says he's been channeling her. Once in costume, he prefers no one call him Louie on set. He is pretty convincing as a molly-cuddling mom, even in person when you know it's him. Do you feel different? <laughs> that was, your collar was a little, thank you. I want you to forget that Louie Anderson is playing Christine Baskets. You do, at least I do. That's what I want. Ah. Oh, I like that. This is a blanket. People say, what do you want to do next? I go, well, I just hope I can play a man again. <laughs> hey, Mom, I'm going to fix this horse thing. You're going to want it to was Galifianakis, one of the show's co-creators, who cast Anderson as his mom and put him in a dress. Do whatever you want, but why don't you try out the new headrest? You know, it's, it's hard to have your own show and not be the most popular one. <laughs> but I'm fine with it. You know, it's, I like it, actually. 
the lovable, fallible, and always motherly Christine Baskets was a hit. Anderson took home a primetime Emmy for the first season and was nominated for a second one last year. It's a great part. Christine Baskets is every woman. There's a whole bunch of Christine Baskets in the world, and nobody's represented them, and I am. He has no other way to explain his success in the role other than he believes his long-suffering mom must be right there with him. Because, you know, that character is, you know, I steal all her nuance and all her, mm, those little looks and <sighs> her disapproving stuff. She's back in a lot of ways, right? You know, she's got the starring role that she deserves. Played by none other than her son. Yeah. I mean, you know, the great thing about my mom was she protected us. She took all the brunt. And this is such a great um, repay yeah, and tribute. I get to pay her back. <laughs> he just finished writing his late mom a series of letters that he's compiled into a book recounting all she's missed since she passed and how her spirit is still making a difference. It's her humanity and her love that I think people are connecting. Even if I bombed horribly, I still had to go back. Gilbert Gottfried! Gilbert Gottfried has been staring down death since the age of 15. Calm down, the act is not gonna be that funny. <laughs> When people talk about dying, is dying the word for it? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's like when people ask me, did you ever die on stage? It's like saying to an Olympic swimmer, did you ever get wet? Uh, so you're a championship fighter. Did anyone ever punch you in the face? Said, okay. okay. Godfrey knows of what he speaks. Three weeks after the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center, at a Comedy Central Friars Club roast of Hugh Hefner, he told this joke. Oh, I have to leave early tonight. I have to fly out to L.A. I couldn't get a direct flight. We have to make a stop at the Empire State Building. And forget it. I lost an audience like no one could lose an audience before. And I mean, they were booing, hissing. And if you had told me from that, that moment of time after that joke that I was there for 10 years, I'd believe you. A talent agent is sitting in his office. But Gottfried the recovered. Family. They might have to clean this up for TV. <laughs> and slayed the audience by telling a joke so dirty we could never show it here. Do you ever die now? Uh, yeah, during this interview. It was important to be funny then because we're in the middle of the Cold War. And it was scary. We thought the Russians were the enemy. They thought we were the enemy. And we both were wrong. It's the French. We caught up with Billy Crystal in Boston, a stop on the current multi-city tour of his Tony Award-winning one-man show. Do you ever get worried, like, what if we give it and they don't come? Mm, not yet. No. Not yet. Not no, yet. No, That's no, been no. great. Of course he's smiling. The show consistently sells out. It's called 700 Sundays. Sundays was our day to go to the boardwalk in Long Beach, play baseball, or even go to a Broadway show. Sunday night was our night to go out to eat for Italian food or Chinese food, because on Sunday nights, Jews are not allowed to eat their own food. <laughs> oh, no, 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 that is in the Bible. Crystal has now expanded his play into a book with even more stories about growing up with his two older brothers in a large, loving Long Island Jewish family. One of my favorites was your grandfather, Julius. Yeah. You call him one of the hot people. What do you mean? What he was cranky. Mean? Grandpa Julius was cranky. I was very close with him because I was a little cranky, too. But he was the sweetest guy. But, but he, he had a bad combination of, of ailments. He was deaf and flatulent. Now, this is, this is murder. This is just a license to kill. You, you and your brothers, though, you used to love to torment poor Grandpa Julius with his hearing with aid. With the hearing aid. Well, I would just, would just, you know, he would try out a new one. And the reason he tried out new ones every week was I would just go up to him. So, Grandpa, another new one. Made, 
And he would just go, another, another piece of crap. This is costing me a fortune. Most of all, the book and the play are a tribute to Crystal's parents, Jack and Helen. They were not afraid to be affectionate in front of us, as, uh, and I think that was great, to know that they were always you know, in love with each other. Pretty great. Jack Crystal ran the family-owned Commodore Record Store in Manhattan, a mecca for Dixieland jazz and the folks who played it. Sometimes he'd even bring a musician home to dinner, including one famous for his raspy voice. I is it true that your grandmother once asked uh, Louis Armstrong well, at a Seder? My grandmother's... A Passover meal. Yes, a traditional big, big holiday. Important What's the exodus from Egypt. It's a big story. It became a very good movie. She said to him, Louis, have you tried just coughing it up? <laughs> Laughed so hard. Billy always loved to entertain. He tap danced. Just the right leg. Can only get the right leg to work. Something's wrong on it. I guess it's the right side of my brain makes the left side work. And of course, he told jokes. You know, you start performing because you want to make your parents laugh. You want to make them laugh. And that started with us. They were great laughers. His dad even encouraged him to study great comics. And then he let us stay up late to watch Jack Parr. I was just a little kid, but I would take my chair, put it next to our old big doom intelligence set, and I would look like I was Jack's next guest. <laughs> Here's Billy Crystal, everybody. Now, of course, he's a talk show regular. Just Friday night, he delighted David Letterman with the story of a recent celebrity you know, golf Murray, outing. Uh, Billy it was actually a Trump's course, and he didn't want to play because it was windy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you ever at a loss for words? I'm sorry. But the good times on Long Island were cut short in 1963 as Dixieland Jazz faded in popularity and Jack Crystal lost his business. You know, it was like um, the pressure of it, two boys in college, one about to go. He was taken ill that summer um, with double vision in one eye, and I knew something, my, my instinct was something was wrong, and then he dies in, in uh, October. Billy was only 15, and it was actually that very limited time with his father that inspired the title of the play and the book. About 10 years ago, I just I started taking stock of myself, and I said, you know, I had about 700 Sundays. That's it, and that's not a lot of time. Helen Crystal, who passed away in 2001, became the financial and emotional mainstay of her family. She urged young Billy to continue playing baseball, his favorite sport, and even basketball, hard for someone 5'7". I'm in my usual spot on the bench. Mom's in the stand. She came to everything. And she let everybody know she was there. Hey, coach, put Crystal in. Come on, we can't fall any further behind. Let's go, kid. In fact, Crystal was good enough to play college baseball. And he's still an avid fan. But his true passion was stand-up comedy. The bus people. Where do they come from? How do they get so many ugly people in one bus? Did Woody Allen cast this town? They wander through the lobbies. Does the bus leave at five? Huh? Years of doing routines like this led to his breakout gig as a mid-80s regular on Saturday Night Live, creating cult characters like Fernando, who introduced new catchphrases into our vernacular. You look marvelous. Do people still tell you you look? That I look marvelous? Yes. It still happens. And that's, you know, it's 20 years ago. Wow. I had to resist saying it myself when I, I first saw you. Everybody said it to me at one point. Ted Kennedy said it to me. Henry Kissinger said it to me on the Concord, flying to England. I ended up sitting next to him. You look marvelous. It was hilarious. <laughs> Another great creation, Crystal's Sammy Davis Jr. I had a lot of spilkes, which means nerves if you're Italian odd she <laughs> and It was an impression honed when Crystal was Davis's opening act. I defy anyone to be together with Sammy Davis Jr. We did uh, 30, 40 dates together. To leave a room and not sound like him in some fashion or form, you just can't. 
help but talk like him. I mean, here's this guy. Who's, why is he speaking Yiddish? So you have, you have a lot of spilkes, huh? That means, that means nervous. Yeah? But you'll see, it's going to be good, and they're going to love you. They're going to kvel all over you. And he's like talking like my relatives. Kvel means proud. You see? They all want to have By the late 1980s, it was time for Billy Crystal to go to the movies. Literally. When Harry Met Sally was a romantic comedy, starring Crystal as the cynical Harry Burns. So you're saying that a man can be friends with a woman he finds unattractive? No, you pretty much want to nail him, too. Did you ever think that it would be a classic one that people just go back to every I, day? No, I knew it was, I knew it was a really good piece of work. And um, now, all of these years later, this is our movie. This is our age group's movie. Crystal followed up with the blockbuster City Slickers, about a man who copes with a midlife crisis by playing cowboy. Oh. Look what I did! I made a cow! And he won kudos hosting the Oscars. It seems like you have always been on a roll in your career. Have there ever been times about... Oh, big time. The 90s were weird for me. There was about four or five movies that didn't quite work well. Something didn't catch the public's fancy, and that, I got frightened. So it was a long period of time, for, as far as I was concerned, that I didn't, I wasn't, I was scared, a little scared. And then analyze this. Analyze happened. this and really then, turned things around, though. Yeah, didn't that it? was a big one. You don't hear the word no very often, do you? I hear it all the time, only it's more like, no, please, no, no. It became a huge hit, starring Robert De Niro as a mobster in need of therapy and Crystal as the straight man, the reluctant shrink. And though Crystal's career may have gotten off track for a while, his marriage to the former Janice Goldfinger has held steady. You know, we were kids. Uh, I met her, I was 18, she was 17. You know, my last date was during the Johnson administration. It's just been the two of us all of this time. And, and it's, it's better, working, huh? It's better and better. We're, we're the Jack and Mary Benny of Hollywood. You know, it's 35 years. It's, it's almost 40 years that we know each other. It's, it's amazing to me. They have two daughters and a granddaughter. But at 57, Crystal shows no signs of slowing down. Sunday number two, my circumcision. This I took personal. <laughs> this is not a good he thing relishes to do, every three-hour live performance loves the crowd's response to the stories that are so precious to him. It, it, does that, is that like a getting your batteries recharged every night for it's you? A, you know, it's a big hug. It's a big hug from a lot of strangers that uh, feel like family when we finish. And that's why this show was so thrilling for me to do. Because not only has it reacquainted me with the past, but it also has reacquainted me with me. It's the living room all over again. What, what greater thrill is that? I'm always home. I realized very early on it's much easier to be clever than to be funny. Meaning? It's very, very hard, really, to make people laugh. But when you do? When you do. You're arguably the most famous of the Python members. Oh, much certainly. more famous. What's your relationship with fame? It's beyond ridiculous. You find it ridiculous? Oh. Does it make you uncomfortable when people approach you? When they gush at me and tell me how wonderful I am, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Do you see what I mean? So I usually say I know. <laughs> uh, but you have excellent taste to recognize it in me. You were headed toward a career in law. Yeah. Do you think that you have a different law. take on law? Law. law. <laughs> Law. 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 I'm sorry, it sounds law. much la. La. I'm from Ohio. La. Sorry, where were we? Law. You were going to be a lawyer. A lawyer. And practice law. A liar. Do you think you have a different take on show business because it wasn't a childhood dream of yours? I always thought of show business as essentially trivial. Trivial. There were serious things going on, like countries being run or armies fighting things. And as I've got older, I realized the whole place is a madhouse. It's a complete write-off. And then I did a talk show. It was Graham Norton. And uh, Neil Diamond came on and sang. And the whole audience sang Sweet Caroline. And I looked at this audience, and I thought, they're really happy. They were benevolent and warm and having a good time. And I suddenly thought, my God, show business is important. It's not trivial anymore. I always thought it was.
That must make you feel better about your life's work, then. I think it does, yeah. Because <laughs> people used to come out and say, oh, you're so wonderful. What are they talking about? I didn't invent a cure for cancer, you know? I'm not Jonas Salk or something. But now I see it more. I see that it's a way of, of just introducing um, happiness. Maybe you are pretty wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I am. But they want the confession. He is brash. My house cost millions of dollars. Don't hate the player, hate the game. He is brilliant. That's right. You don't like gays, you're gonna have a gay son. You don't like Puerto Ricans, your daughter's gonna come home with living a vida loca. And often a bonfire of profanity. I mean, they don't grade fathers, but if your daughter's a stripper, you <laughs> when I'm talking to young comics, I tell them don't curse. I swear, I tell them all the time, because the money's in not cursing. I mean, I'm doing fine, I got a big house, but Ray Romano would laugh at my house. <laughs> <laughs> Ray Romano <laughs> would like, are you kidding? You want me to live in that? Because the real money is in clean. The real money's in clean, babe. All right, I'm real. <laughs> Fear not. Chris Rock, the master of stand-up comedy, is not cleaning up his act, per se. But for the next couple of months, he will be appearing on Broadway in a play using language his fans will find familiar. I'm also learning how to speak French. I'm taking a archery class. There's the names of the actors. Right. And there's the title of the play. It's the mother... Yeah, well, it's got two stars. Two whatever, stars. Whatever that letter, those two letters are. Yeah. Doing a play is a deliberate and risky move out of Rock's comfort zone. Now I realize how big Broadway is. In the last four months, I'm like, wow, they just don't let anybody do this. <laughs> <laughs> What's up with the hat? What hat? That hat right there. The play is a pitch black dark comedy. That's not your hat? <laughs> About five New Yorkers connected by lust and addiction. I'm just a grown man trying to make my way in the world the best I can. It's like Raging Bull without the boxing. <laughs> That's what it kind of is. It's kind of a real adult version of a Honeymooners episode. Is there anything you've done that prepared you for this in any way, shape, or form? The closest I would come to this would be Saturday Night Live. You know what's weird, too? I was kind of looking for the cue card guy the first week of rehearsal. I'm like, Surely they'll have cards at some point. <laughs> Surely Al Pacino's not just out there. <laughs> For two it hours. Must, it must be a monitor or something, a <laughs> teleprompter somewhere, right? I mean, we'll learn it. Yeah, but there's some, there's some backup, right? Uh, by the way, I'm Ralph D., Jackie's sponsor. Play? Rock, who plays Ralph D., an amoral AA sponsor, says he welcomed the opportunity to be part of an ensemble. You in prison looking at a photo, I was in Motel 6 looking at the real thing, and the truth is, we were both happy. I was happy, you were happy, fat. It, it's a weird way, this is like the acting school I never got to go to. And I'm, I'm very interested in seeing how this affects the rest of my work. Because <laughs> in a weird way, it feels like I, I knew nothing. I almost want to buy back all my movies. It's like, <laughs> I'm sorry, America. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. Rock's first movie, a bit part as the Playboy Mansion parking lot attendant in the 1987 Eddie Murphy blockbuster, Beverly Hills Cop 2. Up, man, check this out. I get $10 for cars, I get $20 for limos. What the hell is this? Rock idolized Murphy. He says Murphy was one of the first comics to play to people his own age. I had some ice cream, and I'm gonna eat it all. I'm gonna eat it And in a crazy show business kind of way, it was Murphy who gave Rock his start. There's a story that uh, says that you were in line to buy tickets for an Eddie Murphy show, like at Radio City or something. True, true story. The line was so long. This is before, it's how old I am. You know, before the internet, before, you know, <laughs> back when they had lines, right? And I'm online and I'm reading the Times and I see an ad 
you know, this thing for the comedy clubs. I said, and I just walked from, like something just had a little epiphany, and walked from Radio City to Catch a Rising Star, and signed my name for audition night was that night. Been doing stand up ever since. We don't even have salad dressing. <laughs> we don't have salad. Everybody got salad dressing. No black salad dressing. You know what black salad dressing is? Hot sauce. If all humor is based in grievance, then rock has never had a shortage of material. Irreverent, incorrect, and spot on. There ain't a white man in this room that would change places with me. None of you. None of you would change places with me, and I'm rich. And rooted in experiences he had as a child, being bussed out of his Brooklyn neighborhood to a predominantly white school. Had to get up every morning at 6 o'clock in the morning to go to school and compete with white kids that didn't have to wake up until 8. <laughs> and that's not fair. You know, say so you got a lower mark on the test, they got a teacher going, oh, Chris can't read. I'm like, no, Chris is f***ing tired, huh? <laughs> His four comedy albums and five HBO specials once earned him the title of Entertainment Weekly's Funniest Man in America. But being funny has its limitations. I would say this, when you're a comedian, people, it, it just, uh, people have an automatic opinion about you, especially, especially if you use profanity in your work. That you, like, you don't curse at your kids, like, pass the MF cereal, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, people think that's what you are sometimes. So Rock sought to counter that by writing, producing, and directing his own films. And before I go, I got one more thing to say. Like the 2003 comedy, Head of State. All big and bright. Deep in the heart of Head of State shows you that there was once a point in the very, you know. Recent to, past. In the very recent past that they thought of a black man being president was funny <laughs> to the point a company gave me millions of dollars to make a movie about it, like, here. To make fun of that idea. Like, <laughs> black president, ha, 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 ha. How many of you work in a city you can't afford to live in? That ain't right. No, no, that ain't right. And just five years later. If Senator McCain is elected, we'll have another president who wants to privatize part of your social security. That ain't right. Rock was also the creator, executive producer, and narrator for the award-winning television show, Everybody Hates Chris. Since me and Greg couldn't play sports, we talked about him all the time. An autobiographical look at his teenage years, which is now in syndication and runs everywhere from Malaysia to Macedonia. In 2005, Rock hosted the Oscars to less than rave reviews. Since then, he's kept a somewhat lower profile. Rock, now 46, describes this time in his life as rebooting. You gotta be really good to last. You really do. It's just, you're not gonna get by just on being popular. So I'm really just trying to learn and get better. Being rich, is not about having a lot of money. Being rich is about having lots of options. For now, option one is eight shows a week on Broadway. And then... I'm trying to, you know, be in a position where I could do a lot of different things. Yeah. And they all kind of funnel through comedy. I'm not getting super pretentious. I'm not about to, you know... You're not going to do Shakespeare in the Park? No, I'm not. I think I'm thinking about doing Tyler Perry in the Park. How's that? <laughs> Just trying to figure out which one 